Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to another fresh day of the conference. Um, I'd like to open by paying my respects to the um, Wajak people of the Nuna Nation whose land we're meeting on today, um, next to the beautiful um, Devil Yerrigan, the Swan River. Um, so this first session today um, is about antibiotic allergy testing, and we've got the privilege of having Jason Tribbiano with us this morning. So Jason's infectious disease physician and Director of Antimicrobial Stewardship at the Austin. Um, he has over 140 publications in peer-reviewed journals. And the thing that stands out to me from those 140 publications is the amount that has leapt immediately into our everyday work. So the implementation bit is absolutely fantastic. Um, so without any more, I'd like to invite Jason to the stage. Thank you, Ed, and the conference organisers for the opportunity to speak. It's a privilege to be in Perth and escape terrible Melbourne. I've seen lots of Melbourne people out enjoying the sun. It's much nicer here than home. Um, today I'm going to be talking about antibiotic allergy, um, and obviously it's a passion of mine, and probably give some, I guess, guides if you're going to set up this in your service, um, what that might look like. Uh, so, And I'm also going to challenge you that you should do it, hopefully by the end. So uh, Staph aureus bacteremia, neutropenic fever, endocarditis, streptococcal or enterococcal, surgical prophylaxis, all of them require a beta-lactam and all of which, if you give an inferior drug, they have an inferior outcome. So a lot of this is driven actually by beta-lactam allergy or penicillin allergy. At least one in 10 will report one and at least one in 10 will probably get VANC or, or an alternative. And so the four key questions I think you have to ask yourself if you're setting up a program somewhere else is, what should I, uh, why should I address in the first place? What would the model of care look like for me? If I've learnt one thing is you can't just take one model of care and then implement it somewhere else. How do I actually do it? And what should I prescribe in the meantime while I'm working out if I should do label? And these two in particular, you have to differentiate between the low risk and the high risk. And we're gonna be talking about those two dichotomous groups today. Low risk predominantly being the childhood rash, and the high risk being the severe cutaneous adverse re reaction, things like DRESS and SJS. I'm not gonna talk about moderate risk because they're boring. And what I mean by that is, you know, they are angioedema or anaphylax. I know it doesn't say that, but, but they all lead to skin testing. And so I think the other two have more interesting interventions for an ID micro crowd. So we're gonna focus on those two. Why? Well, I show this a lot, but it's true. One in five patients in an Australian hospital will report an antibiotic allergy. If you look at those with more immunocompromised patients, it's one in four. So it's a huge burden. It's associated with all the things we're trying to improve from our outcomes, including AMS prescribing, AMR, poor patient outcomes, and hospital outcomes. And in particular, there's been a lot of drive now looking at the readmission data, the length of stay, the hospital costs. Uh, health economics are coming to, into this area too, as in all our programs. And so obviously these two in particular are the focus uh, for us. Do we have a solution? Well, I'm gonna use the Australian example, and if you're not from Australia, um, well, we'll, we'll show you why internationally it applies as well. But if you are in Australia and you identify or are determined to be allergic to penicillin, and you are subsequently delabeled, which is removing the penicillin allergy, I'm upset we made up this word because it's hard to explain, you are going to see a twofold increase in narrow penicillin use in a three month follow up period. And this is using a propensity cohort study we initially did at Austin and Peter Mac for people tested in the outpatient setting, but looking at their prescribing subsequently in the inpatient and outpatient setting. You're gonna see a tenfold increase in the appropriateness using the, the NAP score that most of us do once a year. And then we further on did a, uh, a match study looking at a longer 12 month follow up period, looking at people before we implemented any programs and afterwards and saw a fivefold reduction in restricted antibiotic use. So this is an Australian context. Obviously what happens in Australia or Victoria or the Austin doesn't immediately apply to your hospital. But certainly if you look at the international literature, you see very similar. I actually love this paper. It's from the colleagues in Duke that did this nice interrupted time series analysis, implementing a pharmacist led antibiotic allergy program and showed a 12 fold increase in beta lactam usage after uh, an inpatient intervention. So I think this shows what we see here when we intervene globally has the same impact. And why is this true? Because the vast majority are never allergic in the first place. Childhood reaction, uh, most of them are due to a viral uh, infection. There's a lovely paper that describes that etiology. And if they are truly allergic, well, it's lost over time anyway. 50% at five years, 80% at 10 years, and 90% are negative on testing. 
And uh, we love doing this, I guess, in medicine that you, there's an old paper, but I will just repeat it in the modern age. We did the same thing. And we saw that penicillin allergy um, positivity on skin testing drops over time when you look at both penicillin and actually kef uh, cephalosporin allergy as well. So that's that uh, stone at all reference. And in terms of the prescribing, well, the things that we were all taught are wrong. Cross-reactivity between penicillins and cephalosporins is under 2%. The latest meta-analysis, which isn't listed there, shows 1.6%. And that 1.6% is due to people that are amoxicillin allergic, giving a uh, cephalexin or C-claw and amino cephalosporin. And that really does bump up the rate, probably close to 33%. So if you took away that from the studies, it'd be close to zero. Monobactams have zero, as trianam and carbapenems less than 1%. A lot less data, though, in the carbapenems, but from what we have seen, particularly from Europe, uh, we seem to follow their ancestry is very similar. So do we have support? Yes, we now have the WHO that have included in their antimicrobial stewardship interventions practical guide, a whole chapter on delabeling of spurious antibiotic allergies, which is fantastic. Um, We've seen that there's a quality statement in our national standards which say that people with a penicillin allergy should be assessed on emission with a plan introduced. And we've got some motherhood statements from organisations internationally uh, and an AMS guideline that's a bit old now that suggests penicillin allergy assessment probably needs to be a bit stronger when we redo this or it gets redone. Uh, but certainly it's got a place, I think, in the AMS sphere now with policy support. So what? Well, what is the model of care we're going to do? So. There are three models. You could do them all. You could do one. Um, you could have an outpatient predominant model. You could have an inpatient model. You can have a community. And I've given three references here for um, evidence of all of those, particularly with an Australasian focus. Um, and if you first look at it, well, what antibiotics do they focus on? Well, the outpatient tends to be everything clumped together, but there's certainly a predominance of beta-lactams being the target. But if you move to inpatient models, it's almost exclusively penicillin. So I think that's important when you're thinking about your scope of practice. The other thing interesting is that community is really limited evidence. And whilst it's in the ASCII guidelines to go and do challenges in the GP setting, really there isn't a lot of evidence base to support that. Um, and if it has been done, it's been penicillin only. The phenotypes, well, our patient seems to be all. In Australia, we do low risk, moderate, high risk, but there seems to be a lot more low risk in the US cohorts. Inpatient tends to be much more focused on the low risk cohort. And in the community, it's only been low risk. There's been nothing else. And what about testing? Well, outpatient seems to be skin testing. Everybody wants to skin test over oral challenge. In the inpatient, it's probably still a predominance of skin testing because most of the literature is in the US, 70% in fact. Um, but then a little bit of oral challenge, and we'll explain our oral challenge study. And in the community, it's only really been oral challenge, which kind of makes sense. The skin testing is extremely expensive to set up on a single individual basis, so I would recommend against that. So if we're going to start somewhere and finish somewhere, obviously, well, I think we should start with low risk and look at our inpatient models of care um, and how we do that, because it's easier to capture people while they're hostage in hospital. And if we're going to do that, low risk is obviously the easiest low-hanging fruit. So from our, from our cohort study where we assessed everybody Monday to Friday with a standardised assessment tool that was admitted, we found that 47% were a low risk. So this is a good indication why we should focus on the low risk. You could simply start with an assessment or guideline only. So I'm going to have a light touch. We're going to have some sort of assessment process. We might have an internal guideline that one of our units use. And you probably want to do this where you don't have a lot of capacity. There's evidence for this in the ED, ICU and ward setting, but less for the outpatient, because mainly outpatient proceed to testing. And this is a pharmacist predominant space. Lots of good articles here from the pharmacist cohort about doing this assessment only guide. You might add direct delabeling, which is removing somebody's allergy without testing. So uh, they have nausea or vomiting and you convince the patient that it's bullshit. Or it's nausea or it's nausea, vomiting and a faint and you still convince the patient it's that. And so direct labelling with their consent, you remove that from the allergy record. And again, uh, we've done that locally with a pharmacist led AMS ward round once a week, but again, lots of data um, about this. Again, the same areas it could be done. ED is much more problematic um, to do and less data in that space. And again, pharmacist predominant. And the holy grail is to do assessment and then delabel them. And I think in the inpatient setting, the oral challenge is the best. Um, this is a lovely paper out of New South Wales. It did similar work. 
uh, Jama Lee's group from Royal North Shore, and obviously we've got an experience with that and we'll talk about that. Data missing, ED and ICU. I think these are not the places to start. Lots of data on ward and outpatient, and I'll talk about where you should target in that. Obviously, this is a medical predominant model. There's evidence for allergists and non-allergists, so you don't have to be an allergist just to set up this model. So who are we going to target? Um, that graph has gone a bit skew with, but what you can see from our early work um, when we looked at the National Antibody Prescribing Survey that the penicillin allergy prevalence in the hospital setting was 8%. US is almost double. Uh, but certainly these are the drugs I would focus on. Penicillins, cephalosporins, and we'll touch on sulfonamides because I think that's a great group for us to focus on. And then you could target the solid organ transplant, the respiratory group, and ID. If you just wanted to pick three that had the highest prevalence, these would be the areas that you would go to. Now there's limited data for inpatient delabeling for cephalosporins. Whilst it's our second most predominant phenotype, the data for direct challenge isn't there. And when you do look at the data, there's some lovely papers from Kim's group, but they're mainly test doses in people that are penicillin allergic. So a penicillin allergic and you want to give a cephalosporin, you give a test dose. I think you just give the cephalosporin. I don't think you need the test dose. There's also questions being raised about the stability of these groups. Are we picking our most vulnerable? Are they too sick? Uh, maybe we should pick some orthopaedic surgery that are well after they're NOF and challenge those. That's also a consideration to think about, and we'll talk about that as well. So how are you going to do this? Well, it always starts with risk assessment. So I've gone and pulled all the risk assessment tools I could find um, from the literature. And to pick the ones that I think we would need to use in an Australian setting, they have to be derived and at least validated here. Uh, I think we've learned this with a lot of clinical decision rules. It'd be great if they were being used in healthcare networks out of Australia and being internationally val uh, validated. They have to be freely available, demonstrated to be used by non-allergists, particularly in this group here, and it'd be fantastic if they were an EMR adapted, particularly to Cerner, Epic, or things that are emerging in Australia. And so obviously we're biased here, but R1 does do a bit of that, and that's um, uh, the DevChan paper, uh, and we'll show that here. So this is the risk assessment tool that we developed a few years ago now. It's implemented in practice with us. Gr traffic light system, green for go, orange for think about it, red, don't touch them. Um, and it's pretty sensitive in terms of determining who should proceed to oral challenge, skin test, or a specialist review with a sensitivity of 93.8%. What's great is when you see this work go outside your shores. And so this was the adaptation done in the New South Wales group, uh, Brenda McCullen's group, where they adapted it for the kids setting. Uh, a little bit less sensitive, but we're still good for the severe reactions, which I think is where you want to have a safeguard. And this paper came out, which I loved, was the rural adaptation using the same tool. So we have now evidence in a tertiary hospital setting uh, and a paediatric setting and rural and remote. So I think this is um, good evidence that this tool can be practically implemented. Some people say, uh, bugger that, Jason, it's too complicated. I agree with that, it's a bit annoying. So just give us three questions we can ask a patient to tell them if they're allergic or not. And this is derived from the clinical decision rule bit. Can we just plug some simple variables in? And everybody has a go at this, and it's not awfully successful. Again, I've put the same requirements for endorsement here, I think, and there are two. This is the Stevenson et al. paper that was um, led out of WA, which was a retrospective um, cohort study using testing from outpatient centres predominantly with a low risk criteria, uh, which was pretty good. And then obviously we've had a go at that with the PENFAST score as well, which was um, validated from prospective data, then internationally validated as well in a single centre in the US. So this is PENFAST. Um, if you haven't seen it before, um, it groups things into if they've got a penicillin allergy, was it five years or less? Was it one of the severe things like anaphylaxis or severe cutaneous adverse reactions and did they need treatment or couldn't the patient remember? You get a score of possibly five. Zero, very low risk, one and two low risk, and three, maybe I wouldn't touch them. It had good AUCs uh, across the uh, validation cohorts and as mentioned, it was uh, internationally validated subsequently and has also been validated in a European centre in Paris now that independently took PENFAST and subjected it to their anaphylaxis data. And we hear there's two other centres in the US that have done the same thing and built it into their EMR, which is fantastic. It's also freely available for QXMD uh, to implement at your sites. So how might it work? Well, you might get a score of zero. The infant says they had a flat, the mum says they had a flat rash, can't recall any other details, but mum said definitely didn't get any treatment. They have a very low risk of having a true penicillin allergy. Somebody says, I got urticaria in childhood and I got an oral antihistamine. Still very low risk, get a PENFAST score of one. Two, you might have some lip swelling. 
which is often a common reported thing, but they didn't need any treatment. Bit of a high risk. You might not have touched that one, but we would. And three, this is clearly anaphylaxis. You don't want to touch that. Acute onset rash and hypotension and gets a PENFAR score of three. So this is how you can practically use it, and it gives a sense of what scores give you what kind of phenotype. The negative predicted values are very similar, but it drops off slightly at that three, and that's why the less than three was recommended in the paper. Future applications. Well, everybody says, well, well, I get told off when I say this, but, you know, peds are just little adults. They're not. And it was true for the validation in paediatrics. It didn't work. So the AUC is terrible, um, whilst the negative predictive value was OK. So we don't think that PENFAST is suitable in its current state for paediatric implementation. What's interesting was we took it and tried to apply it to a cohort of Bactrim allergies or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or a sulfur uh, reported allergy. And interestingly, it worked really well. So AUC was good with a high negative predicted value uh, with a PENFAST score, or we're going to call it SFAST, less than three. So this data has just been submitted. And what we are doing now is trying to roll this out in combination with the assessment tool uh, on a national scale, and we'll show you that in a minute. So what about if we could just apply all this together? Could we put the assessment tool to help people gather the history, plug it into PENFAST, and spit out a what you should do? And so this is what NAN, or the National Antibiotic Allergy Network, is trying to do. It combines the assessment tool and PENFAST into a digital platform. And I'm going to try and make this work. We'll see if it does. So some sites are going to be participating in this. Uh, let's see. No, it's not going to. Anyway, it would take you through and it would uh, it asks you simple questions, then spits out the PENFAST score and the assessment tool. And so there's a number of sites around Australia, about 40 that have registered an EOI. Uh, if you are implementing a penicillin allergy program, please reach out. Very happy to share uh, and have you involved wherever you might be. Uh, in, in Australia or internationally as well, with some sites in South Africa and Canada also coming on board. So how? How are we going to do this? So I think if we're talking about low risk, it's got to be about direct oral challenge. And most of us would have done this anyway in our practice. Uh, and it's just about standardising that process or having a criteria which we can expand it. This is a lovely systematic review. I do reference this a lot because I I do think it's quite good. It's by the group in the UK in Jack Antimicrobial Resistance. It looks at 13 studies for low risk direct oral challenge with a very low positive rate and none of those being severe anaphylaxis or scar. When you look at the data, the drug is by far and away amoxicillin over penicillin. I think if I look back in time, I probably got myself a little bit muddled up with this. And I would say, you know, if it was before 1970 and amoxicillin wasn't available, give penicillin. But I think it's just practical to say give amoxicillin if it's a low-risk allergy. It's what they're going to get. Unless the patient can really remember it was PEN-VK or I got an IM penicillin, then we will do PEN-VK. But otherwise, I think the default amoxil makes sense practically. The dose ranges between 250 and 500. We use 250. It's still enough to elicit anaphylaxis, I can tell you that. And it's uh, enough uh, to show a delayed reaction as well. So I think 250 is fine, smallest oral tablet really works well when you're talking to patients. I'm giving you the smallest dose available, and that really is a confidence booster. The setting, you could do it in the inpatient or outpatient. There's evidence for both of those. And the observation period, I think you need at least one hour minimum. That's where the data goes. Most of ours, we started at two. We've brought it back to 1.5. Uh, and in our RCT, I'll talk about in a minute, uh, we're doing one. There is some international data for one as well. So whatever works for you, I guess. These are the types of reactions I think are amenable to direct oral challenge, looking at our own experience and the literature. And they all equate to a PENFAST less than three as well. So whichever way you want to slice and dice it, they end up this way. So if you use this criteria, here is our data. We implemented this in a whole of hospital approach at Austin and Peter Mac in Melbourne in a nine month implementation period. We did 200 challenges, 97% were negative. We followed these people up with a survey at 12 months and 5% only were still avoiding penicillin, so that was pretty good. Two year follow up, we did 478 challenges, 98% negative, and I just pulled our data from yesterday, 612 challenges, 90% negative, and again, we've had no serious adverse reactions using this criteria on the ward for now almost three years with a lot of data. This is the benefits, and this is why we got our business case approved long term um, when we uh, went to executive, 97% uh, as we mentioned were negative, we saw an increase in those 
endpoints they're looking at in terms of standard three and standard four. We save dollars compared to our outpatient model. Patients and consumers felt safe when we asked them questions. We saved some bed days as well, and obviously we, we saved outpatient visits. We've got now 2,500 people on our wait list to come and see our clinic. Just not feasible to see all these people. So if we can do it while they're in hospital, it does make sense. The problem is we can do a whole of hospital surveillance and we've built this in, but when I look at our own data, we only delabel 29% of those we assess in a whole of hospital. So it's very resource intensive. So I think we need to find ways of finding that 29% up front particularly if you're a site starting out. I think it's too hard to do a whole of hospital. So I actually pulled this data, this is unpublished. Again, I thought I'd do it for this talk. I looked at our oral challenge data from 2019 to 2022. These are patients that were assessed as low risk that proceeded to oral challenge or they had no challenge. And we did a multivariable logistic regression looking at the predictors, clinical predictors, of who went and proceeded to challenge versus who, who that got assessed as low risk but didn't for whatever reason that might be. It was quite interesting actually because I think it goes against what most people think. Most people want to go to their general medical ward and set up this, but in fact it's the wrong ward. Surgical units were much more likely to progress and surgical indications, particularly uro urogenical, uh, were, were common indications where we were able to progress to challenge. People that had a very low risk were more, more comfortable. So they had a childhood rash, or they had a penicillin allergy, but you found out they actually took a penicillin of some sort. Um, gastrointestinal symptoms were a negative because most of those could be directly delabeled. And if the clinician didn't know where the infection comes from, they were nervous, I think, and they didn't proceed either. So I think these are some good things when you're thinking about implementing a program where you could do it. The other thing is when. So we try and get everybody when they first admitted the door, probably the wrong time, because our median time to oral challenge was actually two days. So it's probably better to go and get them on day two of admission. And Tanya um, paper in New Zealand, when she did a whole of hospital system, looked at only day two onwards. So I think that was a good learning. A lot of them are done after three days when they've got some clinical stability and a fair chunk are done on day of discharge. So again, when you're planning your model, I think this does help in how you're gonna set it up. So for me, for penicillin allergy, I think we focus on the low risk and who are not critically ill. Uh, inpatient only, you don't need extra crash carts, um, HDU beds, and target the last slide where you think you might get the greatest uptake. It needs informed written consent. I'm in favour of single dose challenges with amoxyl and um, 1.5 to 2 hours, probably the sweet spot, but you could go as low as 1. If you're going to prescribe in the meantime, you could use a penicillin with caution, but you should promote the oral challenge and give any cephalosporin. Um, first, second, third generation amino cephalosporin, doesn't matter. What about sulfur? Uh, and so sulfur is following a similar path. It's, it's in vogue, and this was a nice study by uh, a group we collaborate in the US where they did oral challenge to TMP SMX in their cohort in the mainly outpatient setting with similar phenotypes we talked about for penicillin allergy. They found 95% were negative on challenge, but they didn't have a lot of immunocompromised in their group, which is the, thing, the group I think we need to use it in particularly when you want to give PJP prophylaxis. So Morgan Rose, a PhD student of ours, went on and did a similar using our data, an almost identical negative single dose challenge rate, and our group had 50% that were immunocompromised. We've now rolled this out to the inpatient ward and our haematology ward and collecting prospective data in that, and I think we'll find very similar values. The alternative, maybe you could use an SFAST list of three when it gets published. So for sulfur, I've done the same thing. So I use the same criteria, but I think we should focus on the immunocompromised, maybe flag those that are getting pentamidine. We've been able to transition most of our pentamidine to TMP-SMX. Don't discount the trimethoprim. In fact, a lot of our TMP-SMX allergies are due to the trimethoprim. Um, and leverage off penicillin allergy. A lot of these people carry a pen and a sulfur allergy at the same time. For usage of sulfur drugs, please use any non-antibiotic sulfur. There's no cross-reactivity. And dapsone in a low-risk group is completely safe. There's no reason pentamidine should be used in a low-risk sulfur allergy. What about high risk? So everybody gets scared about anaphylaxis. So this was a paper looking at, uh, it was a retrospective uh, multi-centre cohort study in Victoria uh, looking at causes of in-hospital anaphylaxis and those that presented to the emergency department. 
And you can see that penicillin allergy, by far and away, is the predominant allergy phenotype. Cephalosporins and aminos penicillins next. If you look at SCAR, severe cutaneous adverse reactions, penicillins are still the most predominant, but glycopeptides jump up the list, cephalosporins and then sulfonamides. But similar drugs are at play and it all replicates usage clearly. So if we talk about high risk and we think these are true, well, anaphylaxis, when we think about it, is quick on, quick off. The person tells you they had anaphylaxis after five doses, it doesn't make sense. Stephen Johnson syndrome is the slow on and slow off. One is generated by mast cells and histamine, and the other via a, a long T cell mediated process that can be very accelerated on re-exposure. You can get re-exposure of Stephen Johnson syndrome or dress six hours after drug if they've had it before um, because of T cell memory. But here's the thing, attributable mortality in the Hall paper was less than 1%, but for SCAR it's 5 to 25. So I don't know why we're so worried about anaphylaxis, but we should be worried about SCAR, uh, because the vast majority of these are in the bigger group that we have to worry about. So uh, we're going to talk about SCAR in the last few minutes. SCAR, the big ones are SJSTN, DRESS and AGEP. AIN, DILI and fixed drug eruption don't traditionally count as SCARs, although we obviously see some overlap with those groups. If we're thinking about the history to take, there's some key little tricks now. So, latency is less than eight weeks. Typically for DRESS, it's 14 days. If they've been on a drug for more than eight weeks, I don't think it can be the drug. Um, single drugs were historically thought to be the cause, and EBV, you can never have an amoxicillin allergy with EBV. However, things are changing. We recently looked at our data, and we found that the beta-lactam latency, time between drug starting and rash onset, was 4.5 days for beta-lactams and 16 days for VANC, so it can be much shorter for beta-lactams. Single drug, I was wrong with this, it can be multiple drugs. So we've had beta-lactams and glycopeptides implicated in DRESS, and for some reason there's T-cell cross-reactivity or a conglomerate antigen, both are skin test positive and both are positive on our ex vivo assay. So this is an emerging phenomenon. We're also seeing the traditional EBV patient. They generally have a bit more to the story. The rash is more severe. Be amoxicillin positive on skin, or when we re-challenge, get a rash. So vast majority are negative, but there is some true allergy there. We can do skin testing. We look at safety. It's very safe in this group. We've only had one person have an all-over body reaction for skin testing. You're able to find a causative drug in up to 58%, and it certainly helps prescribing. So these are a group of severe cutaneous first reactions with the implicated drug being penicillin. And they have lit up like a Christmas tree to all the penicillins, but not the cephalosporins. We then go on and give these people kefuroxine or kefalexin, and all of them tolerate it. Now, I'm not saying to go and do that in your practice, but it's showing that the mechanism cross-reactivity are different in T-cell mediated reactions. We can look at this also in the lab. Here's a 57-year-old TB patient given HRZE, dress on day 17, we take their blood, we mix it with the drugs, we get a positive to rifampicin but negative to the rest. And this is the assay we use, cause it Ellie spot. This patient went on to tolerate rifabutin. Have a drink. So rifabutin is actually tolerated well in rifampicin dress. Sorry. Pharmacogenomics is the last bit I'm going to end on. So vancomycin dress, an increasingly known phenomenon. HLA3201 is the causative, and it's overrepresented in Europeans. Interesting, we're not seeing cross-reactivity with other glycopeptides, like dalbavancin, ticoplanin. So vanc dress has also particularly got some implications for staph aureus. So my takeaways for high risk, uh, severe antibiotic allergy is really scarred or anaphylaxis. The laws of cross-reactivity are different. In vivo skin testing should only be done in specialist centres. Ex vivo is emerging, and we need to find HLA risks. Prescribing. Be careful, but you can use a carbapenem, and I'm using a cephalosporin where it's life saving, like meningitis. So in 2020, do we have evidence? We sure do. And I'm going to end there by thanking all the people that work in our amazing group, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you.